Okay, folks, we're going to make a start. It says seven o'clock on the, the uh, clock outside, not, not the one here. Um, first of all, I'm going to give my apologies. Amy LeMay can't make it this evening, she's poorly. Um, but we're all here. Yay! Yay! Absolutely. Um, it's so nice to, for, for people to come along. My name's Ian Manboard. I oversee uh, the equalities work at Equity. I um, work with the different committees. Um, and when I started in October, which is a very interesting time to start working at Equity under the sexual harassment um, umbrella, uh, there's a huge amount of work going on. But we foresaw uh, February as LGBT History Month and working with the committee and the chair, Giovanni Bien, who's going to address us later on, uh, we'd agreed that we would do something for this month. Uh, and Rose Collis, who's going to be leading this session, uh, agreed to do um, an event around the history of equity, and particularly uh, the history of equity from an LGBT plus perspective. I particularly welcome that because um, although I'm relatively new to equity, my background is um, educational working with trade unions and including doing work around uh, the history of workers' organisations and trade unions. And one of the things that's very clear is that the history of trade unions tends to be depicted as the history of uh, white men's history, um, which is always the case generally. So when Rose suggested that she would unpick equity's history from uh, an LGBT plus perspective, I thought that was brilliant and I really welcome that. Um, I'm particularly pleased that working with um, my colleague Laura Gilbert, who's been signing you all in on, on the desk, and Rose, that we've managed, despite the weather, um, to get a really good attendance. Um, <coughs> so thank you very much for coming along. Um, one thing I need to do practically before I invite Rose in, who's ready to storm in, um, <laughs> so bear with us, um, is I just need to check, is there anybody here who has said that you're not here this evening? Anybody who doesn't want their photo taken, basically? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always going to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> I said to Mark, I'm always puzzled about events where people are so ashamed <laughs> about coming along to the event that they've, um, they don't want their photograph taken. It's kind of like they've come out of the, their house and said to their partner, well, I'm going to... The, I'm going somewhere other than where I'm going to. So I'm very pleased that you're um, proud to be here. I do hope you have an enjoyable evening. I, I, I know there'll be time for um, uh, questions and discussion at some point in time, but can I introduce Rose Collis? <laughs> my antenna off for the night. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you all. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Not bad. Some of you have clearly been doing panto. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just do one more? Good evening. Good evening. It'll keep you warmer as well. Yeah. So, lovely to see you all. Um, it's People have come from very far reaches in this terrible weather, including me, um, <laughs> which is kind of quite important. Um, well, I expect you're wondering why I've called you all here. Um, <laughs> this is what happens. I got, um, uh, to my great delight, um, elected to the LGBT plus equalities committee uh, last May, last June, whenever it was. And um, equity being a fab union. Um, <laughs> and uh, had a training day for new members. And it's been some time since I've been on a committee. Um, uh, and the ones before were a bit contentious. It was a GLC Women's Committee and uh, the <laughs> September in the Pink Gay Arts Festival, which I know some of you <laughs> will remember. Yeah, so I've got these stars <laughs> kind of down here. And I thought, how great, you're going to have a training day for new committee members to learn what to do and what not to do. And it was in this very room. And um, I come from an outpost in East Sussex, which is not bright, isn't it? And I got up the crack of doom and I got here and I was early. And of course, a lot of people were late. Um, so I was just sort of wandering around the room and I like, photos and pictures 
and I came wandering over here, and, and being of an inquisitive bent, um, I went, oh, oh, look, look, and uh, there's a, um, a document up there with all these people signing on it, and uh, I could reckon, I mean, some of them are really illegible, um, but I went, oh, Beatrix Lehman, hello, <laughs> John Gielgud, hello, <laughs> Ivan Novello, hello, <laughs> and Gwen Frank and Davis and Marder Van. Hello, girl! <laughs> and a couple of other names. And I thought, how interesting, all these gay people. And that was it, really. We got on with the training day. I didn't really think anything more of it, except there was also a photo of Beatrix Lehman up there. And um, anyway, into the brain it went, did the training day. And, uh, and then the next meeting we had, I noticed we were in the Dame May Witty meeting room. I was thinking, all kind of resonates with something. And um, there were other <coughs> names on that list that, 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 va that rang bells in other connections and I couldn't quite put it together, so didn't think any more of it. And um, then we were thinking about maybe doing something for LGBT History Month. And um, so I said, hang on a minute, these people, these people were all pivotal in the founding of this union. How about I put something together, brand new, all singing, all dancing, about those people and their connection to each other and to other things. And so that's how this came about, really. And um, this, as some of you may or may not know, Equity was founded in, in 1930. And this is how the Times <coughs> reported it. Um, in uh, February 17th, 1930, so we're almost on, on the anniversary, and it was all very, very formal, and, uh, but it was pretty well documented in, in the papers. And um, I was thinking about, about all these founders and, uh, and, and what they were doing at that time. And I'm gonna share that with you tonight because I think it's quite interesting. Um, a lot of it, revolved around this place. This is 31 Bedford Street in Cotton Garden. That's what it should look like. <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> it looks like that at the moment because it's been turned into a hotel. But um, that building, that's where the roots of equity were, fa were founded. Um, it was Dame May Whitty and her husband, Ben Webster, and their daughter, Margaret, otherwise known as Peggy. They were all founders of Equity, and for 47 years, their London home was at the top flat of this address. 48 steps and no lift, bad access. <laughs> but they had this large mahogany dining table, and the founders of Equity used to meet around. There was up to sometimes 40 people cramming around this dining table and they drew up its rules and its regulations and its structure and in fact held its first meetings there. And um, that dining table went to the first equity offices. I'm not quite sure if it's still in the building here, but I'm sure <coughs> it's not been got rid of. Now, the, the Webster Witties were, were part of a, an Anglo-American theatrical dynasty and Peggy wrote about them in her book called The Same, Only Different. And um, her mother, May Witty, was, was no stranger to political activism. She said of her mother, it was inevitable that she should be drawn into the women's suffrage movement. Well, I should say so, given who some of her immediate neighbours were. Sorry, that's the Websters in their day wear. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get one of them in their swimwear. <laughs> And uh, actually, it's quite funny. Ben Webster pops up in a, um, a, a he co keeps popping up on films on talking pictures, of which more later. But that's a young Peggy in the middle. But this was one of their immediate neighbours. Anybody recognise her? No. Okay, this is Edie Craig, daughter of Ellen Terry. Okay, and um, she she had a, an actual menage a trois. That's her actual French. Um, she had a partner, Christopher St. John, who was Christabel Marshall, and also a painter called Claire Atwood. And um, they lived on the ground floor of 31 Bedford Street. And um, <coughs> Edie Craig was active in the women's suffrage movement, and she directed a play called A Pageant of Great Women. And she devised that with a writer called Cicely Hamilton, who wrote the lyrics for The March of the Women, 
composed by another wonderful lesbian called Dame Ethel Smythe. So it all all picks up, they all connect. And as Peggy noted, some of the most determined of the militants would take refuge with them, either before or after they set out on some mission, or after they were released from prison. So there's a lot going on in that building. Not anymore. Um, This is Peggy Webster. Now, she was actually born in New York, but she was christened at St Paul's the Actors' Church when her parents came back to London. And um, one of her biographers says, Margaret Webster inherited from her mother a devotion to good causes and fought hard on behalf of actors' equity on both sides of the Atlantic. She was elected to the first Council of Equity, along with her parents, and for three years she chaired the editorial board that produced its first magazine. As she said, the equity years taught me much, just as the suffrage movement had taught my mother to think on my feet, to speak and write, to conduct committee business with order and dispatch. What we do. (laughs) Um, Age just 17, she actually appeared alongside her mother and Ellen Terry in a play written by their neighbour, Edie Craig. So, little circles. Um, Peggy's other early acting career, she understudied Sybil Thorndike in St. Joan and in a number of successful productions with John Gielgud and Gwen Franken Davis. So what was to come for her after 1930? Well, she went back to America in 37 and she formed a partnership with another equity signatory, another founder, Morris Evans. And she directed him in a number of very, very successful Shakespeare productions, Hamlet, Twelfth Night, Richard II. And it was while she was directing Hamlet in 1938 that she began a long romantic and professional relationship with the actress and director Eva Le Gallienne. And together with another lesbian director, Cheryl Crawford, they founded the American Repertory Theatre Company. But when this founded, Margaret just set up her own Shakespeare company and toured it around the States. She was the first ever woman to direct a production at the Met in New York. In 1943, she directed Othello, starring Paul Robeson. She played Amelia opposite him. This production, it was the first ever in America to feature a black actor playing Othello in an otherwise all-white cast. There have been some all-black productions of it, but this was the first that, that was mixed races, as it were. And it ran almost twice as long as any other Shakespeare play ever produced on Broadway. But... Her union activities and directing Robeson, who of course was a member of the Communist Party and famously had his passport taken away, it brought her to the attention of Joe McCarthy. And in 1953, she got summoned to attend his committee. Um, A case was dismissed, but she realised that perhaps she wasn't going to stay in America much longer. And she came back to England, just picked up where she left off directed many successful plays in London and regional. She even wrote and acted in a one-woman play about the Brontes. I don't know if she played Bramwell, but anyway, she did. (laughs) Anyway, she did did that. Um, Her last significant romance was with the writer Pamela Frankow. Some people will know. So that was Peggy. Oh, sorry, there we are. I missed a photo. That's her with Paul Robeson in 1943. Got so many pictures here, I'm going to forget them. Gwen Frank and Davis, <laughs> here we are. Uh, now, she made her stage debut in 1911 and very famously in 1924 was in a very successful production of Romeo and Juliet opposite John Gielgud. Um, she met her partner Mar Devan in 1927 and they were together for the rest of their lives. And they set up home in Gower Street, quite near Rada, and in a place called Tagley Cottage in Essex. There they are. <coughs> Lovely frocks. <laughs> we don't wear frocks like that anymore. Um, Marda Van, she was actually born in South Africa, and she was, funnily enough, very briefly married to a chap called Johannes Strudum. I think I said that wrong. Now, he was actually Prime Minister of South Africa for four years in the 50s. <laughs> Figure that one out. Anyway, um, Marda actually moved to London in 1918, and she trained at the Central School and appeared in a number of productions, plays by Coward and Maugham. Um, she also taught drama at RADA, and guess who one of her students was? 
Joan Littlewood. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, who went on, not joining their sapphic circle. I'm really yeah. happy. Yeah. I'm very straight with her, Joan. So what was to come for, for Gwen and Marder after 1930? Well, in 38, Gwen appeared with Ivor Novello in Henry V, of all things, at Drury Lane. And she was, appeared in the first ever production of Gaslight. She played Lady Macbeth. Oh, no, I've said the N-word. Um, <laughs> for almost an entire year, opposite, John Gielgud. She was a founder of Peter Hall's Royal Shakespeare Company. She won the Evening Standard Award in 58 for her performance in Long Day's Journey Into Night. And in 1963, at the age of 72, made her Broadway debut. So there's hope for us all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, in 1942, because um, the war was obviously affecting theatre quite a bit, so she and Marden went back to South Africa and they set up a very, very successful touring company. And in fact, Noel Coward said that their production of Blythe Spirit was the, one of the best that he'd ever seen. So that's pretty high praise. Um, they returned to England in 1947, and um, Gwen just took up where she left off. Marder actually was on TV a lot more. She was in series like Villette and Our Mutual Friend. Now, Gwen retired from the stage in 1970, but she was often on TV and radio, both as herself and, and in roles. In the 1980s, when she was in her 90s, she appeared on The Wogan Show. <laughs> and she recited word for word Juliet's famous death scene. So again, hope for us all. <laughs> she made her final acting appearance in a Sherlock Holmes mystery at the age of 100. Wow. So <laughs> just keep going, folks. <laughs> There she is with John. I think that was in the importance of being earnest, actually. I don't think I don't think that's Romeo and Juliet unless they directed <laughs> a, a particularly kind of uh, Edwardian take on it. <laughs> Romeo, where art thou the teacup? Um. Anyway, there we go. So, there we are. John, the wonderful John, big fan of his. Um, he came from a theatrical dynasty as well. Of course, his grandmother was Kate Perry, elder sister of Ellen Terry. Um, and by 1930, <laughs> his stage successes had already included The Seagull, um, The Vortex, Romeo and Juliet, Ghosts, Richard II. And that year that he helped found Equity, he starred in Hamlet, The Importance of Being Earnest, Henry IV Part I and The Tempest. So pretty great year for him. Now, his, his significant other for, from the 1920s was um, a chap called John Perry, who was an actor and then later became a playwright and um, actually left him to become partner of Binky Beaumont, <laughs> as you do, um, known as the Eminence Grease of the West End. And John also became a director of Beaumont's production company, HM Tenants. What was to come for John? Well, what wasn't to come for John? I mean, just one of the greatest and longest stage, screen and radio careers in history. Um, he was one of the few people to win all four major American awards, the Oscar, the Tony, the Grammy, the Emmy. Plus, of course, BAFTAs, Golden Globes. He was a Companion of Honour. He was awarded the Order of Merit and was knighted in 1953. But that same year, things could have changed. It could have taken a very different turn. In October, he was directing and rehearsing a, a play called A Day by the Sea. And he was arrested in Chelsea for cottaging. And he got in magistrate's call and he was fined £10. Now, he gave his name as Arthur Gielgud, which was his, his real name. And he said he was a clerk. And he almost got away with it. But unfortunately, there was a reporter there from the Evening Standard who recognised his voice from the radio. Oh. And went, that's John Gielgud. And it broke the story and, and outed him, basically. And what happened next was really interesting and unexpected in, in a number of ways. Um, he had lots of sympathetic letters from Noel Coward, Vivian Lee, Laurence Olivier, Cecil Beaton, Ralph Richardson. He wasn't stripped of his knighthood, and when he appeared on stage in Liverpool the week after the story broke, he got a standing ovation. But there was an actor called Edward Chapman who started a petition to have John, one of the union's founders, kicked out of equity. 
No, it didn't get very far. I think only two people signed it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> funny that. Mm, you want us to kick a gay knight out of our union that he helped found? No, I don't think that's going to work. Um, and you're probably thinking, Edward Chapman. Edward Chapman, do I know him? Well, you might know him from this. Mr. Grimsdale! <laughs> I think it served him right, actually. <laughs> Deserved no better, frankly. Um, the other thing, and I don't think this is a coincidence, he gave a really memorable performance in the 1960 film Oscar Wilde, um, which starred Robert Morley as the gay-hating nemesis, the Marcus of Queensbury, uh, the man who famously didn't know how to spell sodomite. <laughs> so, that was John Gilwood. Um, Morris Evans, he's another of the signatories. I was thinking, Morris Evans, Morris Evans, I that name. And um, this is Morris. <laughs> perhaps not a name that will be familiar to some, but perhaps the face from a number of 1960s TV shows. Yeah, no? no? Exactly, exactly. Well, if you don't yeah. recognise him there, how about that? <laughs> It's the actor's curse, isn't it? He was this great Shakespearean, and yet he has to put a bloody monkey's mask on. And you go, oh yeah, there he is, oh yeah, Morris, oh yeah. Um, really unlikely. But um, also, Rosemary's baby. Hutch, they got your glove! Remember that? He was Rosemary's friend in Rosemary's baby? Yeah, the lights, and you know, cooked her dinner and looked after her, and they offed him, they nicked his glove, and cast a spell on him. I mean, this was all a long way from, from Morrissey's origins. Um, he made his stage debut in 1926, and by 1930, the year of the founding, he appeared in the Oristia, at the Festival Theatre Cambridge, and then did everything from Shaw to Yeats. I mean, he'd done the lot. And, but most notably, what made his name, in 1927, he was one of a group of out-of-work actors, including Laurence Olivier, who were asked to participate in a tryout of a play called Journey's End. And it was directed by James Whale. And it was a success and then transferred to the Savoy. And it, it ran for over two years and basically, he, wasn't, he didn't look like that, but uh, he played the young officer Raleigh, who, who dies at the end of the play. Well, what was to come apart from this sort of thing for Morris? Well, as some of you said, Batman. Yes, correct. Also, Bewitched. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but before all that, um, it was Dame May Whitty who suggested that he joined the old Vic company, and he was a huge success in a number of plays. And um, he was hired to play opposite Catherine Cornell, another of these great dames of the, the stage in New York. And that's when Peggy Webster went over and they all worked together and the rest is history. Um, he became a US citizen because he was working there so much and uh, he joined the US Army in 1942 and he staged over 60 plays for the troops, which is pretty amazing. I don't know if he looked like that, but uh, um, I think it was mostly Shakespeare. I think he did sort of mini versions of Shakespeare as well in case the troops got to get bored and fidgety. <laughs> <laughs> Has been known. Um, but his post-war career included everything from Shaw to Ibsen, and as we said before, Batman and Bewitched on television. So, and you know, really unusual movies like Rosemary's Baby and Planet of the Apes. If you th I think it's is it 50 years ago since Planet of the Apes. Was a, yeah, somebody did an anniversary of it on Facebook. And I went, well, this is really spooky. Um, <laughs> and um, he, he was very great friends with the actress Helen Hayes, and she had a house in Mexico, and he got a house in Mexico. And, and then eventually he moved back to England to Surrey and his last partner was a chap about whom I know nothing called David Barlow. So that was Morris for the moment. Now another of our founding player kings and queens, a chap called Barry Jones. Um, he was born in Guernsey and he actually served during World War I and then became an actor in 1921. And he joined the company of uh, an actor manager called Frank Benson and um, he spent several years in America and then joined another company of Morris Colborne and was spent years touring the US and, and Canada, mostly performing Shaw plays. That's, that's why he made his name. So what was, to come to him, what was happening to him after 1930? Well, from 31, he was 
he was performing a lot on the Canada stage, but also the London stage. And again, everything from Shakespeare to Rattigan and Ivan Novello's Glamorous Night. So it all comes full circle again. But he also made a number of films. He was in Brigadoon. <laughs> and he was Claudius in Demetrius and the Gladiators. So watch out for that when they come up on, on talking pictures. Beatrix Lehman came from a very famous, or what became a famous family. Um, she was sister of the writers John Lehman, who's there in the middle, who was gay, and Rosamund Lehman, who was a writer and was absolutely not gay. <laughs> she would want that said. <laughs> um, Beatrix was bisexual. Um, she was attending a wedding once and she observed at the bride and groom, well, I've had both and I don't think much of either. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of us have been there, haven't we? Been? <laughs> um, I'm saying nothing. Um, she trained at RADA and um, she made a stage debut in 24 and a production of The Way of the World. Um, interestingly, in the 20s, she understudied Tallulah Bankhead in three of her West End productions, which must have been quite an education <laughs> in a number of ways. Um, and in the 20s, Beatrix had a relationship with a woman called Henrietta Bingham. Uh, she was one of those women who were actually notorious rather than actually being famous for, for doing anything. She was heiress to an American publishing fortune, and her family were always trying to get her to stop dating women and marry her off. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when that happens. Um, <laughs> what was the come for Beatrix? Well, um, that is an actual signed photograph. <coughs> um, in 1945, she became Equity's first, and thus far only, female president. So, bit of history there. Now, Henrietta Bingham's biographer asserted that Peggy Lehman's acting career was compromised by her leftist politics and her unusually open bisexuality, which does sound possible. In fact, her and John were both very left-leaning, both gay, stroke, bisexual, and Rosamond absolutely wasn't either, so <laughs> really didn't like that. Um, I mean, Beatrix, was, she was a member of the Communist Party for many years and was on the editorial board of its paper, The Daily Worker. Um, but, you know, despite what that person said, she did have a lot of success. She was, uh, she was in a season at the Shakespeare Memorial Company, and her, she was a huge success in a production of Morning Becomes Electra, and things like The Waltz of the Toreadors, Peter's The Birthday Party, Seasons at Stratford. You know, she did a lot. She was also on television a lot in the 60s and 70s, and I'm sure most memorably some of you will remember this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. She's Professor Amelia. <coughs> this is 1978. Sorry, the club. Oh! <laughs> Give that man some extra peanut. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Professor Amelia Rumpford. We'll say, yeah, he's got it. Uh, I don't know who that chap is on the left. <laughs> um, I think he was just a cameo. Um, she also. She pops up in very minor roles in a number of what were quite successful films. She was in a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, having her feet washed. Uh, it's true. And um, she was also um, she was awarded Britain's Radio Actress of the Year in 1977. So she worked a lot. Now the last 15 years of her life was spent with an actress called Sheila Fraser. Um, they met in 1965, they were in a play together at the Edinburgh Festival called Igloo, which is very appropriate <laughs> in the way it's like outside. Um, now, Fraser was a highly talented and versatile actress and writer, and she had a 60-year career on stage and screen and radio. But like Morris Evans, she seemed to be fated to become nowadays probably more best known for her brief appearance in the first of a series of highly successful movies. The original Star Wars. Can you think who she was? Yeah. I'll have to show you, won't I? Yeah. The <laughs> ill-fated Aunt Beru got incinerated by those horrible aliens. Um, and I keep talking about the, the Talking Pictures <laughs> channel. It's on Freeview, it's on 81. Really, if you, if you don't watch it, you really, a lot of these people turn up in these really old, they look like they're cranked by hand, black and white British movies from right back to the 30s. And, but what they've been doing for some months is rerunning a wonderful series called A Family at War. And it, it's just, it was a, I mean, I grew up with it and aging myself, but it really was a fantastic landmark drama series set in World War II and about 
a Liverpool family called the Ashtons, and Sheila played the, the matriarch, Jean, Jean Ashton, wonderful. Wonderful, I, and I remembered it. And so when I saw her in Star Wars, I went, hang on a minute, you were in Liverpool <laughs> last time I um, Now, she and Beatrix Lehman also had small roles in what is arguably the worst film ever made to feature two gay male characters, and that's Staircase, with Rex Harrison and Richard Burton. <laughs> I mean, Rex Harrison, what, what, but anyway, well, let's, not, let's not go there, because we really wish they hadn't. Um, anyway, so, that's him. Right, Ivan Novello in 1930. What was he doing? What, what had he done by then? Well, he was having his portrait painted. <laughs> um, <in> a, <laughs> apart from it, exactly. Well, at 20, I mean, what a prodigy. At 21, he'd already penned the music for Keep the Home Fires yeah. Burning, you know, the most popular song of the First World War. Um, he'd also, his stage successes early on had included an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice with... Ben Webster, Ellen, Terry and May Whitty. Full circle again. But during the late 1920s, he was actually the most popular British male film star. Um, he'd done um, the silent adaptation of Cowards the Vortex, and also an early Hitchcock called The Lodger, which I saw on a big screen last year, which was absolutely amazing. Very, really quite extraordinary. And what was to come for him? Well, a bit like Gilgood, what wasn't? In the 30s and 40s, he wrote and starred in a string of hit musicals, um, Glamorous Night, The Dancing Years, Perchance to Dream, King's Rhapsody, and of course, Gave the Word. <laughs> <laughs> Funny that. Um, now, in April, 20, uh, April 24th, 1944, during a run of The Dancing Years, um, Novello was actually in court as well, but not for what you might think. Um, it was wartime, there was petrol rationing going on, and he had a home in, near Maidenhead, and he was coming to the West End, and a well-meaning fan said, I, I, you, you can still use your Rolls-Royce, and we, actually we'll register it to my car hire firm, and then you can say it's um, what do you think, the work of national importance. <laughs> but the magistrate... No, wasn't impressed with this. And he, he, I mean, it tells you what it was like in wartime. He gave Novello eight weeks in prison for breaching petrol rationing. Um, Novello served only four, um, but some friends think his health never really recovered because I can imagine, well, I don't think prison's now a bundle of laughs, but, you know, for an actor, four weeks in wartime. And he would have been treated a bit like a traitor, you know, he let him aside down. Um, however, like Gilgood, when he got back to the stage, everybody gave him a standing ovation. So, more forgiving than the magistrates. Now, you know you've got the seven dials up the road, you know, that all these different strands of Covent Garden converge at one focal point. Well, someone called Clement Stain was the focal point for all these strands that I've been talking about, all these founders and indeed many strands of the whole British entertainment industry. That's her in her casual day wear as well. Um, anybody heard of her? Yeah. I don't know, a couple of years. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. Well, okay. We could spend, a, I could do a whole talk yeah. about her. In fact, I have done a whole talk about her, but we haven't got time for all that tonight. Um, between the First and the Second World Wars, Clement Stain, she was born Winifred Ashton, she was Britain's most influential, versatile and successful female writer. Um, there just isn't time to list what she did. Novels, plays, journalism, screenplays, um, broadcasts. She was also a feminist. Um, but also for a few years, she actually was an actress called Diana Cortis. And she joined Equity in 1942 because she returned to the stage briefly to take over from Sybil Thorndike in a, a play called Jacob's Ladder and did a regional tour. And uh, she actually remained a member until her death. And it just so happens I have access to uh, some of her things. And um, there she is, renewing her subs in 1960. <laughs> and there was some sort of anomaly, but there she was. She, was uh, she remained a member, even though that was the only acting she'd done for decades. What else had she done? Well. She wrote a very controversial novel called Regiment of Women, which came out in 1917, some years before The Well of Loneliness. 
and it was about forbidden desire in a girls' school, and it was inspired by some of her own experiences as a teacher and a pupil. Her first play was called A Bill of Divorcement, and it was a hit in London and on Broadway in 1921, and it was made into a film, and it launched the screen career of its female lead, one Catherine Hepburn. And um, notably, she was actually the inspiration for the role of Madame Arcati in Coward's Blind Spirit. And she was not only a close friend of his for about 40 years, she was a hugely important and latterly rather overlooked influence on his work, which if I ever get my biography of her commissioned by somebody, I'm going to make that point quite forcefully. Because <laughs> um, you're probably thinking, why does she know so much about this woman? Well, 10 years ago, the literary executor asked if I'd be interested in ex investigating whether I could do a biography. And I've been trying on and off ever since, and it's sort of it kind of stalled because publishing is a dreadful mess and it might never be commissioned. So I actually wrote a play about her, which I perform in as well. Why is that the um, <laughs> So I get that in now before I forget. Um, what else did she, she do? Right, 70 years ago, she became the first British female screenwriter to win an Oscar. Um, proceeded, and the next one, guess who was the next one? Emma Thompson. <laughs> there was nobody between that. Um, and the film was called Perfect Strangers, and it starred Robert Donat, and it was uh, Deborah Carr's first major role. Uh, she co-wrote Garbo's version of Anna Karenina. She was also, though, a sculptor and a, a portrait painter. Um, she specialised, I mean, she knew actors and, and film stars. And the, the portrait that you saw earlier of Novello, that was one of hers. But uh, I thought you might like to see some more. That's in the National Portrait Gallery. It's also a postcard, it appears on diaries. Um, and it's actually, it's actually a painting she did of Coward. He's sitting at the piano um, and um, composing some tunes. And that's his bust. Um, that is also in the National Portrait Gallery. And that's Shakespeare, an older Shakespeare. And that's at Stratford. And here is Clements with her bust. <laughs> Not a terribly good picture, but then a lot of the pictures in this archive I've got access to are a little bit water stained, I think, is the best way of putting it. But that's 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 at Stratford. So she's yeah, she pops up everywhere. Um I think we've got one more. No. Towards the end of the Second World War, she brought these sort of traditional gypsy caravans, but they didn't have toilets. No toilets, they're just in this field. And um, they were in a corner of the field in Midhurst in West Sussex. And but she was writing for Hollywood and everything. And producers like David O. Selznick used to come from Hollywood and come and visit at the caravans. And he could, co he could cope with having to go for a wee in the bushes. But what he couldn't stand was the fact that she didn't have a fridge and so there were no ice for his cocktails. <laughs> Priorities. So he actually bought her a gas fridge. So there would always be, always be ice for the G&Ts. You know. So... Um, but um, for more than 30 years, <laughs> a London home was um, above a greengrocer's at 20 Tavistock Street, just round the corner. And there she created this sort of Tavistock set, as I <coughs> call them, of writers and actors and artists, composers, designers, everybody. I mean, it included everyone from Noel Coward to David Niven to Joyce Grenfell. It'd be easy to list who wasn't part of it and she was at the centre of it. Um, she had two long-suffering and hard-working secretary companions. The first was Elsie Arnold, and the second was a, a woman called Olwyn Bowen Davis, or Obedi, <coughs> as she became known. And she was actually quite a gifted writer and illustrator herself. But, um, I mean, Dane was a workaholic, and like a workaholic, <laughs> except for me, she had someone to sort of run around and do stuff. Um, but, and, but she would always find fault with Alwyn and, um, you know, everything from, oh, you can't spell and you can't drive and all the rest of it. And there was one famous thing where she gave her a dressing down when some people were around there. And Ivan Novello sort of came out of Tavisock Street and said to a friend, oh, poor Alwyn will get another thrashing before bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't mean literally. Uh, well, not um, now, more friends of Clemency's were a gay couple called um, Victor Steibel, who was a Couturier made Princess Margaret's going away dress. Oh. Of course, she didn't go away, did she? And um, <laughs> <laughs> she, she, this is and this is Richard Adensall. 
Um, he was a wonderful, wonderful composer. If you don't know the name, you don't know the face, you'll have heard his music. He wrote the music for Dangerous Moonlight, Gaslight, The Roman String of Mrs... String? The Roman Spring of Mrs Stowe. <laughs> Try saying that. And Blythe Spirit. So, all these wonderful things. Um, and also, many <coughs> songs for Joyce Grenfell, who Clement Stain introduced him to. All part of this Tavistock set, all linked to the founders. So, how did our player kings and queens become spokes on this dial, which formed around this doyen of Covent Garden? Well, Ivan Novello, for one thing, he performed at the... Clements and Richard Allison wrote a play called The Happy Hypocrite. And it was in 1935, and there's Ivor. Recognise the lady there with him? Yeah. That's Vivian Lee. <laughs> and uh, also in that was, that's Marius Goring, who was also an equity founder and twice a somewhat <laughs> controversial president of the union. I'm saying no more. Um, and Ivor also... Um, he co-produced a musical version that Clements and Richard thing of Alice in Wonderland and uh, it featured Sybil Thorndyke flying on a high wire as the White Queen. I would have paid a lot of money to see that. Um, <laughs> and people did. Um, oh, oh, there's Sybil then. Um, and um, Clements made several busts of him and there's a bust of him which is in the rotunda of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane as we speak. That's, oh, I thought you might like to see Marius in his shorts. This is, down, this is down at Midhurst, and she would get everybody sort of... She got all her friends doing sculptures and stuff, so that's him doing a bust and her doing a bust in West Sussex. Um, Peggy Webster, Eva Le Gallienne, Pamela Frankow, also connected. Peggy Webster played the Red Queen in this 1947 adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. Le Gallienne sort of altered the script slightly, but again, music by Richard Adamsall. But of course, before that, Clements had been friends with Peggy and her parents, neighbours just round the corner. And um, you can see this is uh, part of a letter that she wrote to May in uh, 1944, because um, obviously she was in America at that point. There we are. It was so very nice. How proud you must be of Peggy. We all miss you very much. I never go down Bedford Street without thinking of you. So they're very, very, very good friends. Um, oh, I've jumped. I've sported it for you now. Um, <laughs> well, in 1934, um, Clements adapted the Rostan play, Leglon, um, for the Civic Theatre in New York, and Eva Le Gallienne was starring in it. And uh, Dane was on her way back to England. She'd been in LA, and she decided that she'd come and help out with directing duties. And uh, Eva said, although we all admired and respected her, there were moments when she drove us nearly mad. Her boundless energy overwhelmed us. She billowed up and down incessantly from auditorium to stage in her flowered chiffon dress until we wilted under her barrage of specific readings and meticulous instructions. <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> John Gilgood, how was he connected to it? Well, he'd been friends with Richard Adamsall at Oxford, and one of the shows that Richard composed music for was a production of The Good Companions. But Gilgood also starred in Clemency's radio adaptation of Henry VIII, and she was lifelong friends, not just with him, but also with his mother, Kate. Um, Morris Evans, well, again, the connections are many, but um, apart from his connections with Peggy Webster and Eva Le Gallienne, he actually became friends later in life with um, a chap called Edward Thompson, who was Clemency's editor at Heinemann and also a friend, and he'd retired to Hove, and Morris ended up in Brighton. Um, and he was also friends with her friend James Whale, who she'd met in the 1930s. Edie Craig and Ellen Terry. Well, Clements wrote a play in 1959 called 80 in the Shade, and it was based on the sort of slightly fraught relationship between Edie and Ellen, and it starred Sybil Thorndike. And uh, in 1956, with Terry Centenary, Clements compiled an anthology <coughs> of extracts from plays that Ellen Terry had starred in. And this is all directed by Peggy Webster, and actors included, of course, John Gielgud. And it was all performed down at Small Hive, 
I don't, you, that's been in the news quite lately down in Kent as but the Barn Theatre, and um, it's where Ellen Terry died, and it's where Edie and Chris and Tony also lived until their deaths. How is she connected to Beatrix Lehman? Well, Beatrix starred as Emily Bronte in Clemency's 1933 play about the Brontes called Wild Decembers. Um, it wasn't a huge success; it was it was fairly wild. But um, what an amazing thing happened about more than 10 years ago. Um, a very dear friend of mine called Peter Burton, who's uh, alas no longer with us, he would like to sort of get me sapphic collectibles, let's say. And I don't know where the hell he found this. Um, well, I've got an idea, but um, he got me a copy of Wild Decembers, and it just happened to be Beatrix Lehman's rehearsal copy. Signed by her at the top. That was her family address there. And this is just one. The whole script has got blue bits of paper in it. It's all the stage directions, the lighting cues, what the... Amazing. So that's, that's a bit... I was going to bring it, but I thought... Um, <laughs> where's that gone? Um, so there we go. Uh, Clements was also, of course, friends with Sheila Fraser, even before she knew Beatrix. Um, Barry Jones, um, he was in a play called Moonlight is Silver, which Clements wrote. It was uh, done in 1934, and it was uh, um, written um, and starred Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Gertrude Lawrence, who they were having a, an affair at that time. And um, Barry, Clements' friends were really sort of loyal. I mean, once she was her friend, she was pretty much a, a friend for life. Gwen Franklin Davis was introduced to her by Gilgood and Novello, and again, lifelong friends. And interestingly, a year after Clemency's death, Marda Van appeared in a, a TV series, a TV adaptation of a book called Broom Stages, which is this big, thick novel that Clements had written some decades before. Now, there was one notable event which brought together many of our player kings and queens and members of the Tavistock set. And um, this was a theatrical garden party held in Regent's Park in 1938 in aid of the Actors' Orphanage. And to contribute to this, Clements said, well, I know all these people, and they've got these really interesting hobbies and talents. So she got them all to donate gifts, which would then be sold. And she called it... Buried talent <laughs> dug up and autographed. <laughs> Subtle. Um, and as you can see, under the direction of Dame May Whitty and Ben Webster, assisted by Alwyn Bowen and Barry Jones. And um, if you can't see it, it says, Clements Dame, hobby, sculpture, <laughs> gift, a mask of Ivan Novello. Oh, wow. And there it is. And that is a mask that she made for this play, The Happy Hypocrite, where he was playing a character called Lord George Hale. And that as he was... And they, they, that, that, I don't know where that, what happened to that mask. I think there is one at the V&A, but um, anyway, that's, that's what she donated, amongst other things. Um, also on the list, it says, Gwen Franken Davis, hobby, cooking, gift, an omelette pan. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you should be glad it wasn't a wooden spoon. Um, then we have... Come on, go away, Ivor. We've seen you, love. Um, John Gielgud, hobby, stage design and theatre history, gift, an early stage design of his own with books and a framed print of Hamlet. Barry Jones, hobby, hounds, gift, some dog comforts. <laughs> oh, and this is why. Look, he loves his doggies. He loves his doggies. Um, Beatrix Lehman, hobby, photography, gift, snapshots of her dog and cat. <laughs> um, Ivan Novello, hobby, mascots, gift, two koala bears and several other mascots. <laughs> Thanks for that. But this is my favourite. Marda Van, hobby, riding, gift, an autographed riding crop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying no more. So, ultimately, what became of our player kings and queens? Well, Morris Evans 
wrote his memoirs. Um, this is like gold dust. You can, it goes for a lot of money. You can, you can't, I can't even get it through my library. Um, I say in the early 80s, he moved from Surrey to Brighton um, to a flat in Chichester Terrace, which by an amazing coincidence, or perhaps not, used to be where Richard Adamson and Victor Stiebel lived. So maybe he told them, they told him how wonderful it was. Um, he died in a nursing home in Rottingdean in 1989. And in 2013, a plaque was unveiled to him um, at his birthplace in Dorchester. And I'm afraid I haven't got a photo of that. Um, John Gielgud died aged 96 at his home in Watton um, in May 2000. And um, his ashes were scattered in the rose garden there. And um, as had his longtime partner, Martin Hensler, who died the year before. So they were together. Um, eight years later, the house was bought by Tony and Cherie yeah. Blair. Yeah, yeah. join him. Um, last year, a blue plaque was unveiled to John at his London home in Cowley Street. Um, I think Judy Dench was, was there and other people. Barry Jones, just very quiet, and died at his home in Guernsey in 1981. Beatrix Lehman, um, in 1979, she was up in Manchester performing in a play called The Family Reunion. Um, and at the end of the first week of it, she collapsed with a stroke. Uh, Sheila Fraser brought her back to London and they diagnosed a brain tumour and she died that July. Now, she had a house in North London and she bequeathed that to Sheila, much to her sister Rosamond's disgust. <laughs> <laughs> Rosamond had, had always been jealous of any woman that was close to her sister and she forbade that Fraser woman to attend Beatrix's funeral. Now, fortunately, Beatrix's personal papers were left to her brother John, and they're now with his and other layman family papers, but it's in Princeton University. Um, and in 1980, Trader Faulkner was asked by John to write a biography of Beatrix, but Rosamond vetoed it because she didn't want any mention of her sister's bisexuality. So Faulkner gave up on it because it was like, well, if I'm not going to mention that... So Rosamond Lehman, bit of a git, really. <laughs> Which I think a lot of people will agree with. Um, Ivan Novello, he died of a heart attack uh, in 1951. He, was, he used to live above the Strand Theatre and he'd just given a performance of King's Rhapsody. He was cremated at Golders Green and his ashes are buried beneath a lilac bush and uh, the plaque reads, Till You Are Home Once More. In fact, he's very well plaqued. Um, his plaques are all in former residences. He really is. There's a plaque at Golden. All his former residences are plaqued, including the notorious Red Roofs in Maidenhead. Of course, we have the Ivan Novello Awards for songwriting. That actually goes back to 1955. I didn't realise it was as old as that. Um, and of course, the Strand Theatre is now the Novello Theatre, complete with Ivor's Bar. And um, as I said before, um, in 1952, Clements did this bronze bust. And um, that was unveiled at Drury Lane Theatre, where it still is. There it is. It, I say it's upstairs in the rotunda somewhere. So, um, so that's Oliver. Um, Gwen Frank and Davis and Mardavan. Um, Mardavan died in 1970. She's buried in Gunnersbury Cemetery. Um, Gwen died. She outlived her by 22 years, and she died aged 101. And she's buried in the churchyard near her home in Essex. Peggy Webster, Pamela Frankow. Pamela died of cancer in 1967, and Peggy shared a similar sad fate and died just five years later. Uh, a memorial service was held for her at St Paul's the Actors Church, where she was christened, and Gwen Frank and Davis, Eva Le Gallienne and Morris Evans all attended. Now, before her death, Peggy and Eva had arranged for their personal and professional archives to be deposited at the Library of Congress in Washington. But Peggy ordered that most of her personal letters be destroyed, <coughs> and they were, so including all her letters to Pamela. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But um, about a year after her death, um, Dr Albertine Winner, who had been a friend and also a doctor at the hospice where she died, um, together with Laurence Olivier, who'd been a great friend, they started a successful campaign to get a plaque for Peggy to be put in, in St Paul's next to her parents. And fittingly, it was next to Ellen Terry's ashes, which are there as well. 
and this is the double plaque to the remarkable witty Webster's. It's on the east wall if you go in, if you go in it's up there towards quite near the, uh, what's it called, the altar. I did. I'm um, the And actually John Gielgud spoke at the unveiling um, of this plaque. And in January 73, uh, British Equity News contained this tribute to Peggy Webster, which said, she was not just a dutiful daughter drawn into British equity. There was an instinctive and passionate response from Peggy Webster where a cause was just. And what about other remarkable woman? There she is in her caravan. I mean, she kept up a, it was almost a manic rate of work right up to the end of her life and despite numerous health problems, and um, that culminated in the cancer which took her life in 1965. And Noel Coward's last letter to her was written from his home in Jamaica, and it included the news that he signed to do a film with Laurence Olivier, in which I appear as a queer, drunk, elderly masochist. No, Winifred, it is not typecasting. <laughs> <laughs> that letter arrived the day she died, and he always regretted that he hadn't sent it. When she died, Everybody sent telegrams um, at the top there. John Gielgud, thinking of you fondly, deepest sympathy. Um, Noel, Noel Coward. And then this, most loving thoughts and prayers with you. We shall miss her very much, Pamela and Peggy. So she was cremated at Golders Green and later that year her ashes were scattered in the field where the caravans were in Midhurst. And many of Clemency's Tavistock set and of our player kings and queens are near her plaque in the Actors' Church. But today, few recognise <coughs> her name amongst the glittering stars that surround her. Now, last year, Equity's General Secretary, Christine Payne, said, if those performers who created Equity were here today, I know they would be proud of where the union is heading. And I think our founding player kings and queens will be particularly proud that the union they helped found now has a dedicated LGBT plus committee, which is looking out for those of us who are out and proud in the industry to which they contributed so much and whose legacy we are indebted to. All the world to stage <coughs> and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. These our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. Thank you. No. Questions? Uh, questions? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it would be such a shame not to have an opportunity for some some questions and discussion. Anybody? Any just before I do that, can I just say this just just personally because I'm relatively new to equity and uh, so am I, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, responsible, you know, overseeing the work of the equalities committees. Uh, I couldn't be prouder this evening mm. of the work of our equalities committees mm. in terms of. Uh, in a contemporary sense, um, Rose, you said, um, um, championing and promoting the work of the different equality strands. But in terms of this evening, remembering where the roots of this work comes from, and being and being very proud of it as well. 
So thank you very much for all the time and effort you put into. Well, to thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And really thank Ian and Laura at the back there, who's a wonderful communicator also, who've been an absolute delight to work with and have just been absolutely. We mustn't forget other people as well. Can I just thank Louise Grenshaw? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. As I say on the radio, and anyone else I've forgotten. Well, well actually, not a general, but a, a very specific. Thank you very much as a colleague who um, came along and rescued me. Because we had agreed this months ago. I put it at the back of my head and thought, ah, oh, that's ages away. That's ages away. I know, that's right. what I thought. And this afternoon at about 2 o'clock, I thought, no, oh, it's not that far away. <laughs> oh, and, suddenly. And Louise has made an epic effort uh, from Yorkshire to get here. Well, shut to up. rescue yeah. me in particular. Thank you. So, Louise, thank you very much. Thank so, um, you. So, if you've got any questions, just the next Anybody got here. anything they want to ask? Or, I don't know. Do you want to ask me where the pictures came from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, it's, it's a number of sources because, as I said, I've been trying to um, do this book on Clement Stain and I have not given up. Um, I, I will not give up. I have his breath in my body. And what was ex I mean, it, it just, it's just extraordinary. You kind of feel it's fated in a very spooky way. Like the fact that my friend Peter, more than 10 years ago, bought me that copy of Beatrix Lehman's rehearsal copy before I was ever going to do anything about Clement Stone. And then about 18 months ago, and I won't go into details and I can't say the who's and the where's, but I have been vouchsafed sort of temporary long-term custody of um, a quite substantial Clement Stone archive. Um, there is one in the DNA, which Marius Goring collected, actually. It's a pretty good... But it, it kind of... The two go together, and I don't know why the DNA didn't want it, but apparently they didn't, but anyway, that's whatever. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But what I didn't realise was all her connections. To, to, I mean, I knew the connections to some, obviously. But when I started to, when I saw that, and I went, hang on a minute, Barry Jones, he was a mate of Clemson. Because, and I was going through this archive, and I went, oh my God. And, and I'd seen this telegram from Peggy and Pamela months ago, didn't know who it was, and went, oh my God, it's Peggy. <laughs> and it all just came together in a very, very spooky sort of fashion but maybe not maybe not so spooky mm. um and barry jones i didn't really know about him really good friend of clemency's um and in fact uh, what was really lovely about it was even after she died a lot of them were still really good friends with obedee and they came and took her out to lunch and they they remained friends with noel coward and everybody until until they they died um and i mean if it had time for it the Clement, uh, Noel wrote this most wonderful personal letter to Obedi telling how much um, she meant, Clements had meant to him and how important she was in his work. And that is something, some of his early biographers did include that, how important she was, and then systematically she's kind of ever so slightly been reduced, let's put it politely, like that. So certainly one of the things, if I get the chance to do the book, would be to bring that to the fore. But, so that's where things like the telegrams and the letters and stuff like that, that's where, so, I mean, I, that was incredible. There, there's Clemente's equity mm. renewal. Mm. Whoa. Um, the fact that there's a letter, you know, to, to, to May Whitty. It's just, it was absolutely extraordinary that there was all this, this stuff sort of just sitting there. I mean, obviously things like that, that's, I mean, you know, these plaques, all the plaques are in, um, well, most of the plaques are in St. Paul's Yacht. You should go for a little wander if you haven't been. So, Sorry, I had no voice. But um, was there any hostility to any of these people? I know about John Gilbert, mm. but somebody like Clement Stain, she was so extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. Was there any public hostility towards her? No, because the thing is about Clement, because although I mean she wrote this sort of famous lesbian novel and, and things, but um, she and in fact I. I spoke to someone that knew Obedee and they said that Clements was completely like asexual. She, she, it's like she certainly had lesbian feelings. I mean, she had a, she had very strong feelings to a number of women. The, the actress Diana Wynyard, for instance, very close friends. But it was all 
because something about the physical passion side of it scared her off. So all her passion went into her work and her friendships, and that's that's where it went. But she, I mean, my goodness, name me a famous lesbian or gay bisexual person that she wasn't friends with. It's not, they were just even surrounded. And there's a very famous quote, and it has been verified, that she was at John Gilbert's home, and there was John Perry and Binky Beaumont came to stay, and various other people. And um, they had sort of candles out in the garden. And she went, oh, look at it. It's just like being in fairyland. <laughs> but she was completely, I believe, she was completely unaware I mean, she was famous for, for these double entendres, but she had, she really, really genuinely had no idea of what she was saying. And of course, they would be sitting there going, <laughs> <laughs> but she, 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 um, she, and, and in fact, a friend of mine knew Edward Thompson, who, who was a very good friend of hers, and he said she was just totally accepting of people, and, you know, gay men, whatever, it just, they were just a friend. It wasn't, you know, it just, it just didn't come out. So there wasn't any hostility towards her because she wasn't perceived as a sexual being. Because she, she, I mean, if you see pictures of her, she was just had these enormous, great gowns. Billow, the way they described the billowing gowns. That's what she, that's what she was. She did. She had a real physical, uh, a personal appearance issue. Um, and the, the the person who owns the archive that that I've I've got the loan of said that Obadi said to her that she heard Clements looking in a, she was looking in a mirror and she goes, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. She really, and she was a beautiful woman. She was tall, she was statuesque, she was a beautiful woman, but had some sort of, just didn't think she was. So she would sort of, you know, pull her hair back and wear these big baggy frocks. I and mean, then that's how I sort of portray in the play I wrote. I was put in this big sort of caftan thing and, you know, dresses don't fit me very well. But it was, it was to this whole thing, hiding the body shape. I mean, what's all that about? She was beautiful uh, and glamorous. Um, so she wasn't perceived, although she was part of this circle, um, she wasn't perceived as a, as a sexual being, as it were. She was just, this extra, as you say, an extraordinary personality that was accepted in her own right. I mean, it was almost like she wasn't judged as a woman either, which was quite extraordinary in the time. I mean, 1930, she was taken over to Hollywood. She was a, a script doctor. She was... You know, she was ex respected, didn't have a problem, respected novelist, respected playwright, respected screenwriter. She was, there was something about her. It's quite an interesting thought. Because she didn't portray herself as a sexual being, she was accepted. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. It was, it was quite, it's quite an interesting thing if you, if you think yeah. about it. But um, no, no hostility towards her. Um, except, except, I mean, the funny thing is, because Noel, Noel, I expect Noel didn't sign this document um, because it would have been political, and he didn't do political, um, and that, that, that's the only times they would actually argue was about politics. Because, I mean, very late in life, she um, she signed the letter that people like Arnold Wesker and everybody did um, to to say that no, our our works will not be performed in South Africa or anywhere else that practices uh, racial discrimination. And she didn't have to do that at that point. And, and so Noel didn't like that. We don't, no, done. We, you know, we don't do politics. And so they would always, they, they, well, not fall out, but they, you know, they'd argue about. It. She, she loved arguments, though. She loved having a good debate about stuff. So she, she was, um, she was always politically very active, right, right up until the end of her life. Um, and you know, she didn't have to, but she did. But even then, there wasn't, you know. There wasn't a hostility to it. She she was extraordinarily well loved and well respected, which is a rare a rare combination when you're that successful and you're that talented and and very you know greatly greatly missed by many people. So Vincent Price and Coral Brown brought you and I together. Indeed. All those years ago, um, Vincent Price taught Peggy Webster to chew gum. Did <laughs> <laughs> uh, she walk and chew gum? <laughs> <laughs> um, when Vincent was over here studying art at the Cotol Institute in about 1935, he got involved in his very first play that led him to want to be an actor. That's right. Which was Chicago, the stage play. He, of course, London Point became a musical. And he said Peggy Webster was in the cast. And him being American, he was playing a policeman in a tiny part, but no one knew how to chew gum in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he said, so I had to teach Peggy, and I must say, he said, she did it very well. <laughs> <laughs> I expect she did. She came from a great theatrical dynasty, so it came easily. <laughs> <laughs>
from you. Thanks for that. Um, I'm sure I've heard or read that when Gilgood, after his conviction for cottaging, uh, made his first appearance in N.C. Hunter's play, A Day by the Sea, he was so terrified by making his first entrance that is it Richardson went on with him. No, it's Sybil Thorndike. Oh, Sybil Thorndike. Yeah. Close. Close. <laughs> took him off. That's right. Yeah. Clay left the stage, dragged him on. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is that what happened? Ah, right. And then the story is, I met Thorndike, she said, ladies and gentlemen, Sir John Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. There's, Thank al you. there's also, um, apparently, the, the, the sort of, the joke went round, because the play was called the, the, uh, A Day by the Sea. Yes. And of course, once he got done for cottaging, it was known as A Day by the WC. <laughs> 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 Which, um... <laughs> She was asked if uh, she would allow one of his plays to be performed, but without paying any royalties. Uh -huh. And she was a, a great believer in, in mysticism and stuff. And she, she went to a seance uh, and contacted Norman. <laughs> and she, <laughs> she, she, went, she went back to the producer a few days later and said, Norman says no. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> Norman says no. <laughs> Doing? How are we doing for time? Oh. Yes! You mentioned, uh, yes, our Doctor Who expert! <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Ivan Novello who lived in Maidenhead. Do you know the house? Red Roofs. Red Roofs. Oh. Red Roofs, yeah, because it became, a, I think it became a drama school, or is it a drama yeah. school? or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, there's a plaque. <laughs> that's, that's, where he, that's where he was. He was commuting back and forth in his Rolls Royce, which of course yeah. is just a petrol <laughs> consumption <laughs> thing. Oh, and uh, yeah. it was really, that's, that's just one of those silly things. You know, I think that I, I suppose I thought they'd he'd just get a fine. Yeah. Eight weeks in prison, it's a bit. But, you know, it was wartime and it was like, oh, you know, you're letting the sign down and all that. So, but, you know, I, I, I don't think it was under last room of any, you know, four weeks in prison. Yeah. But again, he was brought back into the fold and everybody went, hurrah, he's back and we love him. You know. Um, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Oh, drink. There's this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent we'll, mind. We will, we, will, we will do in a second. But what I'm going to suggest is, if this is OK, because uh, this evening is hosted by Equities LGBT Plus Committee, um, what I'd like to suggest, and thanks for the, the questions and the, 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 um, the, the comments that were made, is 